Time is tight, so I'm moving on to the next item of business, which is a debate in stage three on motion 17566 in the name of Kevin Stewart on the Fuel Poverty Targets Definition and Strategy Scotland Bill. Members will recall that following consideration of amendments last Thursday, the presiding officer indicated he had determined that no provision of this bill relates to protected subject matter. Therefore, the bill does not require a super majority to be passed at stage three. I therefore call on Kevin Stewart, Minister, to speak to and move the motion. Minister, seven minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer, and I'm very pleased to be opening this debate on the Fuel Poverty Targets Definition and Strategy Scotland Bill. Uh, from the outset, the bill has been a strong and ambitious piece of legislation, and it has been improved through the legislative stages, through building consensus across Parliament, and through consultation and engagement with stakeholders. Uh, we have established a challenging, but importantly achievable target to reduce fuel poverty to the, no more than 5% of households by 2040. Uh, and we have changed the fuel poverty definition, ensuring a much closer alignment of fuel poor uh, with income poor households. And in the illustrative draft fuel poverty strategy, uh, we have shown both the scale of the task ahead, as well as some of the ways in which we can bring about change through taking actions across all four drivers of fuel poverty. I have some thanks to make, uh, President Officer. I'd like to very much thank all the officials who have been involved in the bill, uh, particularly my excellent bill team uh, and my private office. Uh, they should be proud of the role uh, in this bill today. I'd also like to thank the Local Government and Communities Committee, uh, James Dornan, Alec Rowley, Graham Simpson, Annabel Ewing, Kenny Gibson, Alexander Stewart, and Andy Whiteman um, for their input as we have moved forward. Their scrutiny and engagement at stages one and two has improved the bill, and I appreciate their constructive input throughout. Uh, their stage one report included a number of recommendations that I was happy to act upon uh, at stage two, which have undoubtedly improved the bill. Other members, uh, particularly Jackie Bailey, Liam MacArthur uh, and Alistair Allen have paid close at attention to the bill uh, and I want to thank them for their contributions. Our positive dialogue has led to amendments that we have agreed on and have improved the bill. In light of the positive changes uh, this Parliament has made at stages two and three, uh, I believe that it would be useful for me to give an overview of precisely where we are actually at. Uh, the first thing to note is that the singular uh, fuel poverty target originally within the bill title has now become multiple targets. The single metric of the proportion of households in fuel poverty in 2040 has been jo joined by targets for those in extreme fuel poverty and for the median fuel poverty gap with the interim targets to get us there. On top of this, uh, we have had the 2040 targets extended to each and every local authority area in Scotland. Uh, of course, none of the bill's targets uh, will have any meaning unless we have a comprehensive and accurate picture of fuel poverty throughout Scotland. To that end, I believe the proposed new definition puts us in an excellent position. As I said earlier, the definition ensures a close alignment between fuel poverty and relative income poverty through the int introduction of the income threshold based on the UK minimum income standard and the use of after housing costs income. So whereas under the current definition, only around 60% of fuel poor households are also income poor, under the new definition, the proportion rises to over 70%. The proportion of households in fuel poverty in both social and private rented sectors also show significant increases alongside a rise in the number of families recorded as being fuel poor. These are the kind of households whose circumstances are often poorly captured by the current definition. The more balanced picture of fuel poverty that the new definition presents has been further refined by innovations, including Jackie Bailey's amendment for disability benefits to be deducted from a household's adjusted net income. 
The definition of extreme fuel poverty was one of the other major additions at stage two, uh, coming in response to stakeholder input and the recommendation of the committee. And to com complement it, uh, we added in specific targets to reduce it. Remote, rural and island communities are at the heart of the other major change which we introduced at stage two. That is the uplift to uh, UK minimum income standard for households in these types of area. And in preparing the detail of our proposals, my officials worked closely uh, with Professor Donald Hirsch of the Centre for Research and Social Policy at Ruff, Ruff, Loughborough University, even Loughborough, I'll say that again, whose team is responsible uh, for producing uh, the UK wide minimum income standard. I'd also like to express my thanks to him uh, for his invaluable contribution. The initial reactions that I've heard uh, from rural and island stakeholders to our new uplifts and also to our comprehensive island communities impact assessment for the bill have been very positive indeed. Finally, President Officer, the decision to create a new statutory Scottish fuel poverty advisory panel was another measure recommended in the committee's stage one report. And I was happy to support the subsequent amendments from Alec Rowley, which we improved upon further last week. To conclude, uh, I believe the bill is in excellent shape uh, and will help ensure that the blight of fuel poverty is tackled with the seriousness and consistency of effort that it demands. I'm also pleased that this bill has shown how working together with members from all parties discussing issues in advance and reaching a consensus has delivered improved legislation. We can be proud that this parliament is world leading with this legislation. Scotland is only one of a handful of European countries to define fuel poverty, let alone set a goal to eradicate it. Achieving the target will place Scotland amongst the very best in the world in terms of tackling fuel poverty. In that light, I move that the Parliament agrees that the fuel poverty targets, definition and strategy Scotland Bill be passed. Thank you very much. There is no time in hand. Uh, but I'd ask those members who wish to speak in debate to press the request to speak buttons now. I'll call Graeme Simpson to be followed by Alec Rowley. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I got a little bit confused at the weekend when I was thinking about this debate. Um, a, a, a Twitter announcement from the SNP said, here's what we're doing in government to make Scotland a fairer place to live. With a downward arrow pointing to a list of alleged achievements, the first being past world-leading legislation to tackle fuel poverty. Which is what I thought we were here for today, Deputy Presiding Officer. In any case, uh, I'm not sure the phrase world leading is appropriate for a bill that started out at just six pages and was a lukewarm replacement for what we were originally promised, which was a warm homes bill. I said during the stage one debate that the bill originally lacked ambition. I had some pretty harsh words for it and they didn't go down well with everyone. Uh, my good friend Kenny Gibson got himself in a bit of a tiz, I seem to recall. He's not here just now to confirm that. Um, one of the criticisms of the bill was its target of reducing fuel poverty to 5% within 21 years. Now, some have argued that's too far in the future, but now that we've amended it to include interim targets, I think we can be comfortable that at least we have something that's achievable, and that's important. On a visit by the Local Government and Communities Committee to Stornoway, one of the bill's serious omissions was brought home to us, an omission that when using the minimum income standard referred to by the Minister to define fuel poverty to reflect the higher costs incurred by people living in islands, remote towns and remote rural areas. Fuel poverty rates in urban Scotland have improved since 2015, but rates in rural areas haven't, so there's a widening gap. We faced a legislative uh, vacuum and said so. And thankfully the government listened and amended uh, the bill accordingly at stage two. One of the things uh, I think we must ask ourselves when making law is this, will this make a difference 
to anyone's life? And if the answer is no, then you'd be right to wonder why on earth we would spend any time on it. And I think the bill was in that sort of shape when introduced, but we have a very different beast now. And that's down to people cooperating across party lines and coming up with sensible proposals uh, as well as some not so sensible ones. Now, Andy Whiteman has brought forward amendments to keep the focus on all four drivers of fuel poverty. We will now have the Scottish Fuel Advisory uh, Panel. Um, the Labour Party introduced this to the bill and it's a welcome addition. The panel will be an independent advisory panel that will keep the pressure on government. The panel will analyse the periodic reports that have been produced by the government and give their own views on the progress that has been made and whether the fuel poverty targets will be met. It will be a statutory consultee. It's a significant layer of scrutiny that was previously lacking. Thankfully, the government's decided that the funding for the panel can be much higher than originally suggested by Alex Rowley at just over four times. They're to be congratulated on that. It'll make a significant difference to the tackling of fuel poverty and will keep the focus and scrutiny on meeting and hopefully exceeding the targets. The government also listened to calls to target extreme fuel poverty specifically. Stage two amendments defined extreme fuel poverty and set both a final and an interim target for it as well as for fuel poverty. This will prevent people living in extreme fuel poverty being left behind, a fear many of us had with the target as it was originally published. Now, as I said earlier, the government's also listened to concerns about the higher costs of energy for people living in island and rural communities. I also felt strongly that the hard to reach homes in Scotland should not be forgotten about when dealing with national targets. So I introduced amendments that were accepted at stage two and some minor, minor changes at stage three whereby the government must be seen to be working to reduce fuel poverty in each local authority level and for the fuel poverty targets to be targets at the local level. But I was very careful uh, not to place the onus on councils. I didn't want a national figure which ran the uh, danger of overlooking areas such as our islands where fuel poverty is high and harder to combat. I now believe that a bill that was once lacklustre and unambitious, in my view, is focused, strong and achievable. And I think that's what we all want here today. Presiding officer, if this bill is passed today, which I hope it will be, it will be the result of nearly a year of scrutiny. It's a very good example of committee working, of parliamentarians being listened to. There were areas of disagreement, of course there were, but we're in a good place and this is a bill which can change lives. And if I can take one thing from the whole experience uh, myself, Deputy Presiding Officer, it is not to get on the wrong side of Jackie Bailey on anything. Uh, I desist from commenting. Uh, I now call Alec Rowley to be followed by Andy Whiteman. Mr Rowley, five minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. In opening for Labour today, can I say that we will be voting for this bill, mainly on the grounds that any target is better than no target. We know that the last target set here in this Parliament, which was to eradicate fuel poverty by 2016, was not achieved by successive governments. The aim today of getting fuel poverty down to 5% by 2040 is of small comfort for those who are currently living in fuel poverty. As such, we believe we should, across this chamber, be more ambitious for Scotland to tackle fuel poverty. Should we at least not try to be bolder with tackling fuel poverty and work together to do all that is necessary to eradicate it? I had hoped that we could find that consensus to be more ambitious for the target, but as we saw last week, the SNP and Tory MSPs across this chamber teamed up together to vote down the more ambitious target of 5% by 2032. Now, the argument... Now, the... Yeah. James Dornan. Will Mr Rowley accept that he did sign up to the Stage 1 report? This, this, matter, this matter was raised, presiding officer, at the stage two 
uh, after the stage one report. And my answer then is the same answer as I'll give Mr Dornan today. I have listened to organisations up and down Scotland and people living in fuel poverty up and down Scotland who say that the 2040 target is not ambitious enough. And surely that's the job of politicians in this chamber to listen to what people have to say. Now, the argument that comes from the SNP and the Tories are built around the Scottish Government claiming to not have access to all the drivers of fuel poverty. And second, they say that there will be new technologies needed to have that have not yet been developed. When it comes to income, they say that we have no powers. But as Norman Kerr from Energy Action Scotland said when given evidence to the Local Government Committee, and I quote, the Scottish Government may not have access to all the drivers, but it has access to some that would certainly mitigate fuel costs in particular. On the question of being more ambitious and aiming for a 2032 target, Mr Kerr had this to say. He said we need to, we need to scale up ambition. We could all say that 2040 sounds absolutely fine, but that would not give a step change in productivity levels or in the numbers of homes that are to be tackled each year. In all honesty, he, conde he continues, he, uh, it condemns another generation to live in fuel poverty. The 2032 target is based on what we can reasonably expect in a number of parliamentary sessions and with an increase in budget. And that point about budget is for me key. For if we are to have any chance of tackling fuel poverty within the levers that are within our control, then there must be an increase in the levels of funding. We are nowhere near the levels of budget that will be required to tackle the levels of poor housing. It is about time that the government wake up to this fact and acknowledge what is needed to be done. If they want to be ambitious for Scotland, then they need to be bold, put the money in and not rely on the Tories to kick fuel poverty into the long grass. This point was made by Mr Kerr when he talked in the evidence session about insulating homes against rising costs, pointing out that the more energy efficient the home, the less energy it will use. Now, a report earlier this year for, from KPMG on behalf of the Scottish Government said that 1.8 million homes failed to reach the EPC rating C benchmark in 2016. So if we were to meet the 2040 target, then that would equate to roughly 66,000 buildings requiring major improvement each year over the next two decades. Of course, in order to achieve this, it will require much more funding than is currently available, which perhaps goes some way as to explaining why the Tories and SNP are so unambitious when it comes to fuel poverty. In the social rented sector, landlords have been required for some so time sorry, you to must improve conclude. energy sorry. efficiency. We should do that in the private rented sector. Let's be more ambitious and let's tackle fuel poverty once and for all. Thank you. Uh, it's regrettable we actually have no spare time. I call Andy Whiteman to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Mr Whiteman, four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'm delighted to uh, speak in this debate and to have contributed to uh, the work on the bill through its parliamentary uh, stages from its introduction about a year ago. I also want to thank stakeholders, people like the existing Homes Alliance, Energy Action Scotland, uh, Di Alexander and other who's, others who have engaged very constructively uh, with this bill and also to my local government colleagues and the Clarks and Spice during stage one and stage two. I think the bill has been quite a collegiate process and I commend the way in which the minister has positively engaged with uh, myself and colleagues in other parties uh, to improve uh, the bill because I do think we have actually pushed the ambitions of this bill uh, further, particularly on uh, the, ma the, the matter of uh, a scrutiny of securing the target. It is disappointing, it remains disappointing that this was not a warm homes bill as the SNP manifesto uh, promised, uh, but this debate is nevertheless an opportunity to reflect on where we've got to uh, with this, this legislation. And it is encouraging, following stage two, we now have a bill that I think does its best um, to seek to eradicate 
fuel poverty in Scotland, although, of course, it is just setting out targets and definitions. And the real work in doing all of that will be in implementing a fuel poverty strategy and in uh, partners uh, and stakeholders in local government and elsewhere who have a big job to do uh, over the next 20 years or so. And amendments, I think, proposed at stage two have strengthened this bill, making it a far more robust piece of legislation. These include the provision of additional heating uh, regimes uh, lodged by Jackie Bailey. And despite being thwarted at stage two, uh, she tenaciously pursued these at stage three uh, and uh, persuaded the Scottish Government um, to make some amendments in that regard. And likewise, the cross-party approach has ensured that the four drivers of fuel poverty uh, are in here. And I'm very glad uh, they are. And I thank colleagues like Alexander Burnett, who's famous £60 million pound amendment uh, fell, but nevertheless, um, and Alec Rowley, who, who helped amend the section with their own, own important uh, contributions. And I particularly pay tribute to Alex Rowley's amendment on the Scottish Fuel Poverty Advisory uh, Panel, because one of the things we were quite clear on uh, after stage one scrutiny was that if this target was going to be achieved, uh, and of course it might not be, but if it were to have the best chance of being achieved, it needed independent scrutiny of uh, not only where we are with the target, but why we were there and what we might do uh, in future. And I think the work of the Scottish Fuel Poverty Advisory Panel, which is now put, put on the statutory footing, will be critical, I think, um, to the meeting of these targets. So a good compromise is often cited as when both parties are dissatisfied with the outcome, but I don't think that's the case uh, here. I think the cross-party working and engagement by uh, the Minister and colleagues, are particularly on developing things like uh, enhanced minimum uh, income definition, uh, definition of extreme fuel poverty, uh, improved scrutiny of the fuel poverty strategy, elevating the role of the Scottish Fuel Poverty Advisory Panel are all to be uh, commended. And I think it's a good example, certainly given me some uh, pleasure uh, to have been able to work with colleagues to secure legislation uh, like this. There are, of course, disappointments, presiding officer. Uh, it's disappointing that the amendment to more actively, to be more ambitious um, in tackling fuel poverty in relationship to the target of 2032 we haven't been uh, secure, uh, be able to secure that. Uh, I think this does undermine the Scottish Government's assertion that its response to the committee report, in its response to the committee report, that Scotland will be amongst the very best in the world in terms of tackling uh, fuel poverty. And I think it also does compromise the Scottish Government's recent climate emergency declaration, as this was the opportunity to tie uh, the targets to other targets uh, around energy uh, efficiency. But we are where we are, and I think sincerely this is a very good uh, bill, uh, nevertheless, and I and my colleagues will be supporting it at decision time. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. I call Ian McArthur, followed by James Dorn and Mr McArthur. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The choice of whether or not to heat your home or eat a meal is not one that anybody should have to face in this day and age. The sad fact is, however, that according to government statistics, around 613,000 households uh, are estimated to be living in fuel poverty and 174,000 in extreme fuel poverty. It blights communities up and down Scotland, yet we know that those living in remote rural and island communities consistently experience the highest levels of fuel poverty and extreme fuel poverty. There are many reasons for this. Uh, longer, harsher winters, uh, being off the gas grid, uh, more hard to heat properties, uh, lower average household incomes, uh, higher costs in installing energy efficiency uh, measures all play their part in placing Orkney uncomfortably at the top of the pile when it comes to fuel poverty. That's why it was so disappointing that the original bill took so little account of the rural and island dimension to this issue. It also ignored the advice of the Rural Fuel Poverty Task Force and almost every individual and organisation working in this sector across the Highlands and Islands and other rural parts of Scotland. To his credit, the Minister listened to the case I made on behalf of stakeholders in those communities, a case that was supported uh, by colleagues across the parties. The amendments that we were able to pass at stage two will, I hope, ensure the needs of those in remote rural and island communities are recognised and then met through the additional resources that inevitably will be required. Again, I wish to put on record my thanks to all those who helped build the case in Orkney, the Council, Housing Association and Thaw, but a special mention to Diane Alexander, Chair of the Rural Fuel Poverty Task Force, who gave such compelling evidence to the committee and proved to be the most tenacious advocate for the communities he has served over many, many years. Of course, there were, those were not the only changes made to the bill. Indeed, it was striking to me how progress was made in strengthening this bill, thanks to the efforts of each and every member of the committee and others besides. As a result, we have the advisory committee on a statutory footing with scope for recommending that targets are made more ambitious. Uh, there will be a requirement on each local authority to make progress towards achieving those targets and interim targets so that no area 
uh, or community is left behind. And there will be greater flexibility in assessing needs so that resources can be more effectively targeted uh, and all four drivers of fuel poverty taken into account. Uh, for these and other improvements made to the Bill, I would acknowledge the efforts uh, of colleagues from each of the other parties, as well as the Minister, who has worked, I think, constructively uh, to reach agreement. It remains to be seen whether uh, our failure to accept Andy Whiteman's amendment on the commencement comes back to haunt us, the revenge of the, group, of the geek, one might say. But, President Officer, it is important to bear in mind the benefits of reducing fuel poverty go far beyond simply removing the need for people to choose between heating and eating. All the evidence shows that lifting people out of fuel poverty helps improve their physical and mental health. Unsurprisingly, living in a warm, dry home helps increase educational attainment as well. Local jobs are created and sustained in the energy efficiency and low carbon heat industries, while households have greater energy security and money to spend. And our ambitions for tackling climate change are also reliant on us making progress in improving energy efficiency of our housing stock. For all these reasons and more, the bill matters. In passing this much improved bill this evening, however, we will have done only the easy part. We now need to make sure that it and the strategy make a real difference to individuals, households and communities that for too long have been blighted by fuel poverty. For now, however, I have pleasure in confirming that Scottish Liberal Democrats will be supporting the fuel poverty bill later on this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Mr McArthur. I call James Dornan to be followed by Alexander Stewart. Mr Dornan, please. Thank you, President Officer, and I'm delighted to be given the opportunity to speak in today's important debate, a debate which further enhances Scotland's place as a world leader when it comes to addressing fuel poverty. Everyone, no matter their income and employment status, should be able to heat their homes and keep themselves and their families warm. It's absolutely unacceptable that people are still making that choice of whether to keep themselves warm or to keep themselves from being hungry. According to recent research, the UK is the second worst rate of excess winter deaths in Europe, with over 3,000 deaths each year caused by people not being able to afford to heat their homes. So this shows why we needed action. Indeed, the Scottish Government has already taken action, backed up by significant investment to improve energy efficiency, keeping homes warm and bills down. Uh, recent figures show that 97,000 households in Scotland moved out of fuel poverty in 2015, and their the figures are good. But of course, faced with high fuel bills, we know we still have much more to do to eradicate fuel poverty. Presiding officer, as a convener of local government and communities committee, I sincerely like to thank all the members of the committee, the MSPs who came before us, those who submitted evidence and the Minister of All and all these officials. But I'd be remiss if I didn't thank the committee's clerking team, along with colleagues from Spice and Outreach, for all the fantastic work that they did to allow us to find out, A, the true impact of fuel poverty, and B, the best way to combat it. I think all the members would agree that the Minister throughout the Bill's progress has been incredibly helpful, and I'm grateful for his cooperation over the last few months. The burgeoning bromance between him and the always constructive and cheery Graham Simpson has been a joy to behold. Turn, turn, turning to some of the amendments of, of the Bill itself, I'm delighted that MSPs voted in favour of the Scottish Government's amendments which were moved on Thursday. Most of the amendments were technical or tidying amendments, many of which I know already had the backing of a number of MSPs. At stage one, I expressed my own concerns that the government did not accept the committee's recommendation to place the Scottish Fuel Poverty Advisory Panel on the statutory footing. And I'm therefore really pleased to see the government now supporting this. And on that note, I'd like to briefly comment on the government's Amendment 60, Amendment 96, name of Alec Rowley and Amendment 60A and name of Andy Whiteman. I was pleased to see Amendment 96 pass and indeed Mr Rowley's other amendments making the panel a statutory consultee for both the strategy and preparation of periodic report. However, I couldn't support 60A in the name of Andy Whiteman. The Scottish Government supported the statutory panel as the cap meant administrative costs were not going to be excessive and resources were focused on tackling fuel poverty on the front line, not backroom functions. Indeed, the Scottish Government's Amendment 60 introduces a new three-yearly cost cap of 82,000 on the statutory panel, calculated on the basis of a similar sized panel to the existing non-statutory body. However, there was a real risk with Amendment 60A that it would cost the public purse a lot of money that could otherwise be spent on improving people's lives at home. I was delighted to see the Group 2 amendments failing to garner a necessary report. And whilst I recognise that Mr Rowley's amendments were well-intentioned, the Local Government and Communities Committee scrutinised the bill carefully, took evidence from a number of people and concluded that the 2040 target date was realistic and achievable. And Mr Rowley talks about increasing budgets regularly uh, on a number of fronts and, and particularly on this. But, you know, 
whilst we've got limited resources uh, to create growing the economy, then we're going to have limited resources to be able to increase the budgets. And in my view, and that of the committee's report at stage one, there really is no credible alternative plan that shows that bringing the target date forward eight years could be achieved without major risk. It was even suggested that pushing for the earlier target of 2032 could in some cases actually lead to increased fuel poverty levels due to higher installation or operating costs for householders or bring forward mandatory interventions in homes. An unrealistic target ignores the many concerns that have been raised, including from COSLA, which had said setting unrealistic targets is callous. And that was based on the fact that we, as Mr Rowley talked about earlier on, the earlier target of 2016, which we were absolutely at no stage ever anywhere near to completing. Signing off, sir, I'm very proud that we've reached this stage of the fuel poverty bill. It says a lot for the maturity of this parliament, government ministers and members alike, that we're on the verge of making this incredibly important bill law by working together. I look forward to decision time when we officially confirm the fuel poverty target defini de definition and strategy Scotland bill, making it law so it can begin to benefit the lives of many Scots still suffering from the blight of having to choose between eating and heating. For me, this is a good day to be an MSP. Thank you very much. I call Alexander Stewart to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Mr Stewart, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to participate in today's debate on the third stage of the Fuel Poverty Bill. The bill undoubtedly is a positive step forward in tackling fuel poverty in Scotland, and that's what we needed and that's what we require. It is concerning that estimates suggest that in Scotland today, a quarter of households live in fuel poverty, rising to over 50% of households in Orkney and Western Isle communities. Fuel poverty is driven by many factors, including energy costs, energy inefficiency, household incomes and energy use. And we have to acknowledge that we do not have control over all of those factors. The 2002 target set uh, to eradicate fuel poverty by 2016 has clearly not been met. Government efforts have focused on improving the energy efficiency of homes, but rising energy costs have meant that fuel poverty levels are now significantly higher than they were set back in 2002. As we set out in our manifesto in 2016, we in the Scottish Conservatives are committed to reducing fuel poverty and ensuring that everyone lives in an easy to heat home. And to that end, the initial stages, uh, we broadly support the bill as it goes forward. And we also support the recommendations uh, from the uh, Local Government and Communities Committee, which I am a member of. And I would thank everybody who gave evidence and all those who participated to ensure that we had a very positive dialogue throughout the whole uh, journey of this bill. The bill takes on a very welcome approach, clearly setting out uh, the revised definition of fuel poverty based on the calculation of minimum income standards and takes into account living costs. And that is very welcome. We also welcome the fact that the Scottish Government uh, publishes the fuel poverty strategy and consults with those living who have lived in fuel poverty prior to its publication. In terms of amendments, we were not able to support Alex Rowley's uh, that brought forward a target uh, for, for 2042 because we believe that was unrealistic uh, uh, and uh, the, the 2032 was much more uh, uh, talked about uh, throughout the whole process. Uh, and the amendment would require that there was more than 10% of households in Scotland were in fuel poverty by 2035. And to that, that 3% of households would be in extreme poverty. And the medium fuel cap uh, would not be more than £300 in 2015 prices once inflation is taken into account. So as of its stage two amendments that included an interim target of 2030, uh, of more than 15% of households being in fuel poverty and no more than 5% of households being in extreme poverty. This will ensure that we continue to keep our momentum and we are, and ensure that we go towards the target of 2040 as we also ensure that local authorities want to play their part in addressing this issue, and we are therefore uh, uh, introduced the amendment to that to 2040 itself. And this would require councils to have their uh, own achievements targeted by that timescale. We also support uh, the section which was covering the Scottish Fuel Poverty Alliance panel, which covers ministers' duties uh, to provide financial resources uh, and to stipulate the total maximum cost of the panel allocated throughout the panel. So, Deputy Presiding Officer, in conclusion, I very much welcome the bill and I support what the amendments have put out and been outlined within this report uh, and within this debate structure. 
Fuel poverty remains a massive issue for many individuals. We've already heard today that some people decide whether they heat their home or they feed themselves. Uh, and that uh, in, in Scotland today is something that we have to acknowledge and we have to tackle. So it is a significant way forward. We have still a long way to go to ensure that we have that majority of people who feel safe and secure, but we can be proud of what we have put in place today and I support the bill. Thank you. Thank you. I call Jackie Bailey to be followed by Annabel Ewing. Ms Ewing is the last speaker in the open debate. Ms Bailey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Let me declare an interest as the Honorary Vice President of Energy Action Scotland. Um, as the Minister in the first Labour-led Scottish Government, I was responsible for establishing the fuel poverty target. So let me start with a look back because history is indeed always instructive. It was the Housing Scotland Act of 2001 that committed Scottish ministers to ensuring that by November 2016, so far as reasonably practical, persons do not live in fuel poverty. Now, I think we all at the time felt that this was an ambitious target, but it was one that all the parties across the parliament agreed on. Now, it isn't often that you find issues that transcend the political divide. So it is disappointing that with that level of consensus, we failed to meet that target. So in reflecting on what happened in the past to understand where we went wrong, it is good to look at that to understand what we need to do in the future. So in 2008, I came across a members debate. MSPs then thought that the target was tough but achievable. Nicola Sturgeon, when she was Deputy First Minister, um, reconvened the Scottish Fuel Poverty Forum specifically to provide advice to ministers on how to refocus the policy and how to achieve the target. So at that stage, we were still talking about eradicating fuel poverty and achieving the target. In 2011, members of that forum were telling ministers, they were telling parliamentary committees, they were telling this chamber that unless there was a substantial increase in resource, we would fail to meet the 2016 target. The spending level, as I recall back in 2012-13, was 65 million. At that time, the economy Energy and Tourism Committee said that it needed to be in the order of 100 to 170 million to achieve the target. If you strip away financial transaction money, which we know can only be used for loans, the budget now is still less than 100 million. Last year, it was underspent, something that was a feature in previous years. And I know it's difficult to put loans into a budget and expect them to all be fully utilised. So we do need an ambitious target. We do need a route map, which is the strategy for how to achieve it. And we do need the mechanism to monitor implementation closely. But we also need to have enough money in the budget to realise our ambitions. And I would be very interested to know, to know if the minister has assessed what it will take by way of budget to realise the target. Does he have an indication of what money is required by 20, so that we achieve the target by 2040. The bill has been improved by the government and it's been improved by committee and other members since its introduction. And I very much welcome that and the minister's willingness to discuss changes. It'll come as no surprise to him that I remain, however, disappointed that the target of tackling fuel poverty, taking fuel poverty down to 5% by 2040 remains unchanged. It is genuinely, in my view, lacking in ambition. As a reduction of just 1% a year and potentially condemns yet another generation to fuel poverty. I think the target should be 2032. And I'm genuinely sorry that the government, aided and abetted by the Tories, I might add, has chosen to ignore the voices of experts in the field of fuel poverty, people like the existing Homes Alliance and Energy Action Scotland, because they all evidence the need for a more ambitious target. Now, James Dornan, I thought, hit the nail on the head when he suggested that there was a burgeoning bromance between Graham Simpson and the minister. It can be seen to in the planning bill. Um, but, and I clearly frightened Graham Simpson. I'm so sorry about that. But let me say gently as I can to him. Interim targets are no substitute for ending fuel poverty a full eight years earlier. It is slower than it needs to be. You can have interim targets for 2032 as well. No, I think we've heard no, enough member, from you the member already, must Mr. now Simpson. conclude, and I'm not friend of you, Ms. Bailey. So thank you very you much, presiding conclude. officer. I will conclude on that. Thank point. you very much. And I now call Annabel Ewing, then closing speeches. Ms. Ewing.
Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I am pleased to participate in this afternoon's Stage 3 debate on the Fuel Poverty Target Definition Strategy Scotland Bill. And upon reflecting on the legislative process with regards to this bill, I would like, in addition to thanking the Local Government Committee clerks and indeed SPICE, uh, 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 and thank them very much for all their hard work, I would also like to pay tribute to the way in which the Minister has conducted uh, matters throughout the course of the bill. It really has been a constructive process, and it is clear that all members of the Local Government Communities Committee were full square behind the key principle underlying the bill. And that is, presiding officer, to set a target to reduce fuel poverty in Scotland. And the ambitious and realistic target agreed to by this Parliament is to reduce fuel poverty to no more than 5% of households by 2040. Much discussion, of course, has been focused on the target itself. Uh, and it should be recalled indeed that at uh, stage one in our report, after having heard all the oral evidence and having studied all the written evidence received by the committee, all committee members across all parties supported the approach set forth in the bill. And I quote, the committee understands that this approach is a pragmatic response to previous attempts to set a target which ultimately failed. We also recognise that reducing fuel poverty will lean heavily on applying technology still in development and that it is realistic to build in time for those to come on stream. The committee went on to conclude, and I quote, the committee therefore accepts the government's reasons for setting the target date at 2040. This acceptance of the main tenant of the bill was, however, conditional on the government uh, bringing forward amendments at stage two on a statutory interim target. The government did so, and we have also seen this approach further strengthened at stage three with a further interim target having been agreed. At the same time, the Scottish Fuel Poverty Advisory Panel will be able, if circumstances permit, to propose an acceleration of the target. That, presiding officer, seems to me to be the best way to proceed the pragmatic way to proceed and reflects the approach in fact favoured by those who will actually have to deliver the fuel poverty strategy on the ground, including local authorities. And it is also, presiding officer, as a matter of necessity, the only approach open to us, given that two of the four key drivers of fuel poverty fall out with the absolute control of the Scottish Government, those being energy prices and household incomes. Concomitant with the target date is the key definition of fuel poverty itself, the focus being very much on those who are most in need. At the same time, it is to be welcomed that the Minister acceded to the committee's calls to set a separate target for tackling extreme fuel poverty and provisions on enhanced heating for those with disabilities and long-term illnesses are also to be welcomed. And I too look forward to the work being undertaken to develop the fuel poverty strategy underpinning this bill. Presiding officer, as I said at stage one, it is absolutely unacceptable that people in Scotland, an energy rich nation, are living in fuel poverty. And whilst we on these benches will use every power at our disposal to resolve that, it is self evident that without control over all of our resources and over all of the levers of fuel poverty, that is to say, without the powers of a normal, independent country, we will continue to be constrained in what we can do. Something that the Labour benches seem quite happy to see continue and to see Tory rule rather than home rule. That is as unacceptable to me as it is to an increasing number of people in my constituency of Cowdenbeath as well as across Scotland. For it is only with independence that we will see real social justice in Scotland. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. Closing speeches. I call Pauline McNeill to be followed by Alexander Burnett. Ms McNeill, four minutes, please. Presiding Officer, I welcome the reintroduction of a fuel poverty target, the previous one having been missed, and Scottish Labour support the bill. I also welcome the new definition and the work of the committee in amending the bill, I think, to make it a great deal better than it would have been. However, I am very disappointed that the narrow scope of the bill I believe it should have been the Warm Homes Bill, and I believe that the bill, at least in passing, has to be part of a centrepiece of wider policy around warm homes. As the Minister said, it's a serious challenge, but all the more reason why I think it should have been wider in scope, because the First Minister herself last year said in announcing £54 million to help eradicate fuel poverty, she said, the investment highlights our commitment to tackle fuel poverty and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, recognising the important link. 
Um, I do believe that the two significant amendments to the bill, the first is the change to the definition um, of the uplift for rural communities, is extremely welcome. I'm sure um, Liam McArthur doesn't need me to point out that in Orkney, fuel poverty is high as 59%, but I'm sure he'll welcome the fact that I've said it. It is one of the most significant amendments to the bill and most welcome. Secondly, the advisory panel gives me some hope that in the long run we can scrutinise how we are progressing with these targets and I think it's a significant and very welcome amendment. But the evidence shows, and we all agree on this, that living in a cold, drafty home has a negative impact on people's physical and mental health and in children's attainment. And in Scotland, we live in a cold country. That speaks for itself. And increasingly, people probably feel the need to heat their homes most of the year. And it's a consideration, I think, in any policy looking at warm homes and reducing fuel. Four drivers of fuel poverty, the cost of energy, energy efficiency of homes, and how households use their energy and household income. And I believe that all four of these drivers can be affected by both government action, government policy, and legislation. The UK has the highest rate of excess winter deaths. It's the only figure I could find. It was a UK one, but we know that we still face excess winter deaths, and it's the worst rates across um, Europe. Um, the wider issues that I do believe and in my amendments to the bill try to address that. The majority of consumers are still in standard variable uh, tariffs. They are still paying way over the odds, I think. I certainly educating consumers about how they can change that is the role of government. I believe that vulnerable customers um, should uh, have a program designed for them because energy companies are not doing enough. I believe they should be required to contact vulnerable customers. It could be a public information campaign to make sure that those customers are on the cheapest deals. Uh, in my last uh, 40 seconds or so, presenting officer, uh, I just wanted to mention uh, the need to ensure that the, the centrepiece of the whole warm homes policy also focuses on the energy efficiency drive within homes. Tree payment meters are something I wanted to mention because the poorest people are on tree payment meters and they face potential disconnections. Scottish Power has a pretty good policy on that. I think ministers should check to see whether all energy companies are adopting the same policy to make sure that poor people are not disconnected for their energy. So in conclusion, presiding officer, the, I think the evidence of the success of this bill is in the detail. We need a higher dose of ambition. Or one commitment we will give the Scottish government to cite our disappointment is, if you make this a centrepiece of wider action on what can be done... Sorry. Sorry, that was my alarm going off. <laughs> I, hope it, I hope it wasn't your morning well, call. Right Was it telling you to finish? Yes. <laughs> I call on Alexander Burnett to be followed by Minister Kevin Stewart. Mr Burnett, follow that five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, and I'd firstly like to note how pleased I am to see this bill finally coming through Parliament. You know, too often we focus on the small things, rightly so, uh, but looking at the bigger picture, this bill is the first step to positive changes for many across Scotland. Uh, and so I'd like to join my fellow Scottish Conservative colleagues in welcoming this bill. Uh, and also, as usual, note members to my register of interests on this bill in relation to energy efficiency, property management and construction. Now in Scotland, currently a quarter of households live in fuel poverty, uh, with rural and island communities living with higher fuel poverty rates than urban areas. And as existing Homes Alliance have noted, nearly a million homes fall below the energy efficiency standard needed for our health. And change has not been coming fast enough for people, therefore causing consequential health implications and cost to the NHS. Now, at stage one, we supported the bill uh, and pledged to make amendments to strengthen it. Uh, and we were concerned that the bill did not outline how the Scottish Government would be held accountable if it did not meet the targets outlined as well as to how to address issues that affect islands and remote rural areas. So we are very pleased to have worked with members across the chamber uh, and that the government have accepted amendments to align with their bid for homes to reach an EPC rating of C or above by 2040. Now, we would of course have wished for stronger EPC targets for 2030, uh, but we do accept that adding in interim targets at 2030 and 25, 2035 will also bring benefit. Now, as my colleague Graham Simpson said on Thursday, these interim targets will ensure that by 2030, we will see the overall fuel poverty rate to be less than 20%, and with a further reduction to less than 15% by 2035. And it will also ensure that the final aim of no more than 5% of households are in fuel poverty by 2040 is reached. 
So I was pleased to see uh, that Amendment 72, in the name of my colleague Graham Simpson, was passed. Uh, and this required the strategy to set out the approach Scottish ministers intend to take towards all targets and interim targets in each local authority area. And with such varying differences in fuel poverty across Scotland, this is a much welcomed addition. Now, I note that Andy Whiteman said on Thursday, I will probably go down in history as a member who almost moved a £60 million amendment at stage two, uh, and I do not regret attempting to do so. Uh, in order for us to see any radical changes to fuel poverty levels and to create real change in reducing carbon emissions, we need to invest in improving energy efficiency levels now. And so to clarify members who may be simply looking at the cost, I was seeking to ensure that there was an actual identification of residential buildings and the work required in order to reach the EPCC rating uh, by 2030. Uh, yeah, certainly. Andy Whiteman. Burnett for intervention and clarifying in fact his amendment was about the identification does he agree with me that actually there are much cheaper ways to make this identification in the standard EPC uh, uh, methodology and there are also new technologies emerging and that sh he should stick with it uh, and he'll have my support uh, in pushing for better means of identifying the homes that are, are most in need of energy efficiency measures across Scotland. Mr Burnett. Uh, I think we can always look to improve the EPC methodology and we're always welcome for discussions about how we can improve anything uh, which ultimately benefits people uh, in, in fuel poverty uh, and in cold homes. Um, because you know, this work you know, will be required at some point uh, and the sooner it is legislated for the better. Uh, and this is just an example of an issue that Scottish Conservatives and stakeholders alike have had with this bill in that it doesn't go far enough and is not going to bring people out of fuel poverty fast enough. But nevertheless, it is a good first step to take. Uh, and I'd like to briefly note my disappointment uh, that Amendment 77 in my name was not passed. Uh, this would have provided detail on the approaches uh, that will be taken to remove poor energy performance as a driver of fuel poverty uh, in order to meet the target set. So to end on a positive note, uh, and as the constituency MSP for Aberdeenshire West, uh, I'm pleased to see that this bill will look after remote rural areas. Uh, and by setting out a minimum income standard for these areas separately, uh, it ensures that these communities are taken care of in a realistic manner. So overall, we welcome this bill uh, and are committed to reducing fuel poverty. Uh, and this bill will begin the process of ensuring that. So as we stated in our manifesto, yeah, we are seeking this change to help households save on their energy bills, make homes easier to heat, create thousands of jobs all over Scotland and all whilst reducing carbon emissions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I'll close on Minister Kevin Stewart. Close to the Government. Six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, it's a bit strange having split this stage three into two. Um, and in the last uh, debate, uh, being accused of compromising with Ms Bailey and today being accused of uh, having a bromance with Mr Simpson. I don't know what's going on here. Uh, I've obviously uh, missed something myself. Uh, but after listening to the debate this afternoon, um, it's quite clear that members of all parties fully appreciate that it is absolutely imperative that we remove the blight of fuel poverty uh, from communities throughout our country. Uh, and I firmly believe that the measures contained in the Fuel Poverty Targets Definition and Strategy Scotland Bill uh, will ensure uh, that we achieve that goal. Um, the challenging yet realistic targets uh, which the bill introduces will ensure that tackling fuel poverty remains a pressing issue for this and for future governments. And the new definition uh, it creates will give us a better understanding of the nature of the problem that we've ever had before, helping us to develop a comprehensive strategy to solve it. Now, I know that in all of this, not everyone is satisfied. Some folk always want us to go faster. I understand that, and I understand the stakeholders who uh, wanted uh, to move quicker in that regard. But we also have to take cognizance that while some of the experts that Mr. Uh, Riley uh, mentioned said 2032, uh, those folks who are delivering on the ground, people like COSLA uh, and various companies, say that that would not have been achievable um, and that 2040 uh, was the best date. Now, I'm always a man who looks for compromise and that's one of the good things about the additions to the bill. 
uh, because the panel itself will be able to look at whether or not we can move the target date um, uh, to a, a, a nearer time. Um, and, you know, we will keep a close eye on all of that. Also, of course, in Energy Efficient Scotland itself, um, we will continue to monitor how we are doing, what technologies have come into play, uh, and whether we can up the ante uh, in terms of driving forward quicker. I, for one, agree with everyone here today who has said that no one should have to make the choice between putting on their heating or eating. Um, I think we all feel that way, and I think it's incumbent on in all of us as we move forward to scrutinise how we are doing in that regard, and I'm sure, uh, along with the panel, uh, that that will happen. Um, some of the other points that I want to touch upon relate to uh, some of the things that um, folks have seen in their travels. Mr. Simpson was talking about going to Stornoway. Um, I myself have been to all of the islands and various other places to talk to people uh, around about the changes that they wanted to see, which are now um, encapsulated within this bill. Uh, I know that um, uh, some folk have already paid tribute to Di Alexander. I think he deserves the tributes that have been paid uh, from folks in all parties around about his efforts. Uh, but we should also take cognizance of people and communities, people and organizations and communities who have uh, made their voices heard and their voices are, are now uh, encapsulated uh, within the bill. And beyond that, um, I don't think we've play, paid enough attention to this. Uh, this is the first bill that has been island proofed. Mm -hmm. uh, and I am very, very grateful uh, to everyone who played a part in achieving that. And there are maybe lessons from this bill um, that can be picked up uh, in other bills. Uh, some of the debate today, President Officer, has strayed on to the, fuel, the four drivers of fuel poverty, and some have picked up on the fact that we don't control all of those drivers. I'm pleased that Mr. Whiteman uh, and others at stage two uh, looked at uh, the four drivers in some depth, and uh, that we as a parliament and the committee in the future should look at all four drivers. What I would like to see, and I hope that we can work across the chamber, uh, whether uh, we're happy with the current devolved settlement or not, I hope that we can persuade um, the UK government uh, to look at energy costs, particularly in some of the areas that Ms McNeil mentioned in terms of prepaid meters, which I think are scandalous, and to do more when it comes to tariffs. And I think that we can work across this chamber together to try and persuade some of the changes that are required uh, to be highlighted uh, to the UK government and hopefully we can see change. I would like to see those powers coming here, but in the meantime, let's see what we can do together uh, to actually uh, make the change um, that is required. Uh, Presiding officer, I see you staring at me. Uh, does that mean that I'm almost out of time? Well, let me finish on this. Uh, currently, there are still far too many people in our country struggling to afford to keep their homes warm. Uh, that's a situation that I find completely unac unacceptable uh, and hearing others today, I think we're all in agreement. Um, it is clear uh, that this parliament uh, thinks the same on this issue. Uh, let us work together uh, to make sure uh, that we do all that we possibly can to take people out of fuel poverty in this country. This bill will help us bring that situ situation to an end, and I hope that everyone will support it here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, that concludes uh, the debate on fuel poverty targets, definition and strategy Scotland Bill. It's time to move on to the next item of business. We have a short pause to allow the front benches to take their places.